just a minute. Good, good evening, everybody in India, and I'm here. This is Amit Shah. Good morning, sir. Good namaste. Good evening, sir. Sorry, I was nice. minute late. I see an international audience. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, let good me evening, know sir. It. Yeah. Hello. So, so we are. We we are all here, Dr. Dipali Bora, HOD of CS department in SIT, and Dr. Shruti Patil, HOD of AIML department of SIT, Symbiosis Institute of Technology. Thanks, and sir. you know this face. <laughs> Hello, how are you? Fernando? Fernando is in person here, sir. We are missing you. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. I'll, Maybe I'll, in, yeah. Maybe in future we will see you. In person. Yeah, I, 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 I'll be coming to India for the first time after four years after COVID uh, in this uh, December, January. But it will be a tight pack schedule. Okay, so please okay. sir, visit. It is, it is very nearby Gujarat uh, to SIT campus and please visit uh, to SIT. Have some yes, time. Okay. You are very uh, warmly welcome at Symbiosis Institute of Technology. Just let us know you are uh, and give some time to SIT from your tight schedule. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yes, let's let's talk about it later. Yes, sounds yes, good. Yes, definitely, sir. Definitely. And uh, Dipali, ma'am, should I proceed? Yeah, yeah, you can proceed, ma'am. Okay. Sir, should I start? Yes, please. Just let me know. Okay. So, uh, first of all, a very warm welcome, sir. Uh, today, I have this opportunity to introduce you with all of uh, the participants and uh, all the professors, uh, authors. So most welcome, sir, from Symbiosis family and all organizers and participants. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation and supporting us in our events. So I would like to introduce with you, uh, to you with uh, all participants who are joined here. So Professor Amit Seth is an educator, researcher, and entrepreneur. He is the founding director of the university-wide AI uh, Artificial Intest uh, Intelligence Institute at the University of South Carolina. He is a fellow of IEEE, AAI, AAAS, ACM, and AAIA. His awards include IEEE CSW, Wallace McDowell, and IEEE TV 
SVC Research Innovation Awards. He is among the top authors in computer science. H index is one, uh, 115 and uh, more than 56,000 citations, top 50 out of 80 in the USA world uh, in the research.com. He has co-founded four companies, including the first semantic search company in 1999 that pioneered technology similar to what is found today in Google semantic search and knowledge graph EZDI, which developed knowledge infused clinical NLPs and NLU and Cogno e Labs at the intersection of emotions and AI. He is particularly proud of the success of the of his uh, more than 45 PhD advisees and postdoc in academia, industry research, and entrepreneurship. So today his talk title is Building Trustworthy Neurosymbolic AI System with Explainability and Safety. Knowledge is the key. So thank you so much. And once again, welcome from all of us, sir. It's up to you now. And please take over, sir. Thank you. Fantastic. I hope you guys have all enjoyed the first day of the conference. Um, it's my pleasure indeed to uh, give this talk. Um, if there are any questions, feel free to ask. Let me arrange my desktop a little bit. Yeah, that is it. Okay. Are you? I hope you are all able to see my screen. It's probably loading now. Yes. Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. we can see. Great. So um, I, I'm mainly going to, you know, uh, introduce to you the idea of the um, role of knowledge um, in the context that in the last few years, especially uh, since 2012, where uh, deep learning got introduced and 2017, where the transformer model uh, was introduced, uh, and that has led to uh, exceptional, you know, um, attention, very high attention to AI. So, and, and now everybody talks about uh, generative AI and chat GPT. So while, um, you know, the attention to AI, even for common person has increased quite a bit, um, there is still uh, challenges and uh, more to do, especially challenges regarding things such as explainability and safety. Um, there are many application classes, let's say in healthcare uh, or uh, you know, in finance, where it is uh, very important that you can explain uh, you know, why uh, AI system is recommending a certain solution. So in that particular context, it is very important uh, for us to understand what are the still, uh, you know, what are the things that are still missing from the AI system. And in that context, I'm going to, uh, you know, at least introduce to you all, um, you know, why knowledge is very important um, in the, you know, and, and you'll see more and more role of knowledge uh, in the AI system. The AI systems as we have today are considered to be data-driven system, given a very, very large amount of data. Um, you can train the AI system. Earlier systems used to be, uh, you know, we need a lot of progress in supervised learning. Um, you know, recently with uh, large language models, we have seen, um, you know, uh, extensive use and success of um, unsupervised learning. So that is good. That has been all data driven, learning from the data. And I would say that what I would like to just simply um, share in this talk, um, I'll just give you insight as to why that is not sufficient. Uh, why data alone is not enough, why you do need knowledge. Um, and if you think about human decision making also, we don't only rely on data, we have our own knowledge, we have our own uh, experiences, and we use them in making decisions. The same thing needs to be uh, needs to happen uh, with regards to the AI systems. Um, otherwise, they will not uh, be as much useful, at least for a class of application. Uh, before I get started with the talk, um, uh, I, uh, you know, lead the AI Institute of South Canada, and um, we are around 50 researchers now. We started in 2019 when I moved with my small team from another university and uh, has had this wonderful growth. And we do a lot of things. Um, uh, in the center of this uh, graph, you see um, a smaller oval that talks about core AI topics that we work on. 
and outside we work on broad variety of what we call as translational AI topics or application of AI, uh, substantial applications of AI. Many of them are, all of them are real world uh, challenges that we deal with. So it's a very exciting, um, you know, uh, um, area for students and researchers to grow at the AI Institute. Uh, students are doing phenomenally well. So the talk is, uh, you know, um, I guess this is short, you know, I won't sp spend time here on content. Let me start with, um, uh, you know, the generative AI systems or large language models, which are darling of today, uh, what is still lacking? Now, I do want to put in a caveat. Um, uh, I have some examples here. Uh, they are, uh, you know, they were generated a few months ago, earlier this year. Uh, and but the technology moves very fast, so the same example may not work if you use. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, if you give the same question to uh, Chat GPT uh, or uh, different language models or even the same language model at different times, you'll get same different results. The reason is that um, the answers are constituted on the fly uh, from the probabilities, all those parameters that the language model has learned. Um, so, uh, you know, um, with that, I plus um, new technologies keep on coming. So I may have generated uh, answers, th these examples using chat GPT and BARD may uh, have different answer. And uh, things may improve substantially. So there are things from chat GPT, uh, you know, for, based on uh, three, uh, GPT 3.5 to four, things have uh, improved in some context. And uh, at the same time, we also hear that the things have, uh, uh, you know, uh, become worse. So worse. So I think that um, it's a moving target, but still the idea are still valid. The, the ideas that I'm going to present are still valid. So here, um, uh, you know, um, what happens you see in the graph here is that there are all these words and the, um, uh, the, the uh, language model uh, is transfer model is uh, trying to create the statistics, the parameters, learns the parameters, essentially how um, various uh, words and tokens are collected. And the tokens may not be even the full word. So when you ask, uh, you know, um, let's say something about me, this is something my student asked. So he found uh, that um, the system just made up what is AIISC. AIISC is AI Institute of uh, South Kenya or artificial intelligence, uh, you know, Institute of South Kenya, but instead it makes up um, artificial intelligence Integ integrated intelligence system center, right? So um, uh, that, of course, is not correct. Now, what what, what is happening here? Well, perhaps um, you know the system is creating, uh, you know, using, you know, starting with uh, Amit Sheth, the uh, the system is. Um, uh, simply looking for other words around Amit Shet in, in a particular context. And, uh, you know, it says about leads, right? So uh, it picks up some things. Now, it so happened that um, I used to do a lot of work in integrated intelligent systems or integrated systems. Uh, so intelligent systems also. So it is kind of combining things from various things. But that's not the, what is in the real world, right? So this is one um, a problem with the system. Here is the thing that I asked, uh, you know, uh, a, a distributional, you know, AI system, the, the uh, you know, one of the um, uh, systems that works with images. And I, I asked it to tell me about Elon Musk and um, Kamala Harris's marriage. And it entirely makes it up. It makes up, of course, the figures on the left and it makes up the text on the right, right? So, uh, of course, these guys are never married, they, you know, they well, you know, the one is a politician, other is a entrepreneur, but uh, it just makes up, right? It does not have um, uh, information. It is not grounded in the information that these are two people who have never been married together. So uh, um, there is a uh, there are problems with reasoning uh, in this area. There is some recent improvement. So again, the uh, my caveat uh, in the remains. Uh, but here, you know, uh, so the question was asked. Um, answer is relatively evident, but uh, reasoning is uh, poor by the system. Uh, here, um, the question itself has the answer. 
the white horse of what is the color of the white horse of Napoleon? Well, um, you know, the answer shows you that um, it says that it's not possible to determine the color of the white horse of Napoleon because white horse implies the color of the horse and that understanding is simply not there in the uh, you know language model the ai system simply does not understand uh, you know the facts it does not have that you know it does not uh, know that indeed white horse uh, is the you know uh, horse with the color uh, and uh, now a human know, would know this very well but for the language system it is simply um, a term right so it, it really does not have what we call understanding this is the most important thing uh, it does not have common sense common sense is one of the forms of understanding there is a question here being asked uh, and it is very clear uh, from the question and you know ma uh, about mike uh, mike's mom has four kids so human would know that mike is um, a, you know son of uh, the that particular mother and you spelled out other three but um, the system is not able to answer this question. Um, they all, you know, all the all the four names are in the um, input, but a system does not uh, make you know understand this. Um, here is a question where um, uh, there is a conversation going on. This is a mental health uh, chatbot, and. Um, um, the chatbot would um, construct um, generated text from all the, you know, uh, distribution AI uh, information it has, uh, and it when it constructs the text, it could be uh, using terms or concepts or language that may be unsafe. Now, a human would not do that. So, with the mental health. Uh, patient, you don't want to use the term, are you self-destructive? Because that could, uh, you know, emotionally hurt uh, the mental health patient. So um, there have been a number of cases where chatbots have been racialized or, uh, you know, they uh, have been made to do things that uh, they should not be doing. Uh, and they violate uh, various norms or rules or, you know, things that we consider to be safe in the human society. And so in this kind of context, um, it's necessary for us to create a guardrail uh, to prevent, uh, you know, the AI technology, in this case, chatbot from uh, communicating, uh, you know, things that are um, hurtful, right? So uh, uh, to be able to, again, do these kind of things, uh, I would argue that you need knowledge of what is safe, what is not safe, right? So... Um, the knowledge, you know, the, these guys uh, can be trained um, um, at particular time. Uh, it costs tens of million dollars or more uh, to train them. Uh, and um, this, uh, you know, in this particular case, uh, Chad GPT was uh, trained on in September 2021. And uh, you ask for current prime minister of UK and it does not know. Uh, the current prime minister because that prime minister has changed since the time it was trained. So these are some of the challenges um, of uh, you know having the kind of systems uh, that we have today. They um, you know they do some wonderful things, um, and uh, the answers often look very um, uh, confident, but uh, sometimes they are uh, you know uh, amazing, and sometimes they are totally wrong. The system simply does not understand. I deliberately use the word NLU, natural language understanding in the title, as opposed to natural language processing. The understanding part is what um, the systems uh, are still not very good at. So um, uh, from the perspective of NLP and NLU, you can see on the bottom NLP and NLU. And, um, you know, in terms of does the system understand and can it explain? Uh, you can see this graph says that, you know, deep neural network, uh, they're very good at NLP, natural language processing task. Like, like, like you know, they can do wonderful uh, task in natural language um, uh, translation in the, uh, uh, in the high resource uh, languages. 
um, and uh, they can explain uh, using some techniques um, why um, you know how they um, came to that result um, but um, that may not be relevant to what user is looking for so to go towards natural language understanding you really need to uh, you know go towards use of knowledge so um, um, there are a variety of techniques uh, today probably i will not go into uh, much detail but i will give you uh, some idea of um, what these systems look like um, so knowledge infused neurosymbolic ai or uh, knowledge elicited neurosymbolic ai these are the new class of techniques that are evolving where both data and knowledge are exploited not just data but data and knowledge and uh, how do you connect a data driven pipeline in a knowledge driven uh, process you know computation that is where uh, uh, the, much, the some exciting you know what research is being done um, now with regards to the current system what is the fix one fix is um, that uh, okay you make language models larger so they can create more statistics they uh, you know have more connections there is uh, but you know when you increase these so called parameters uh, yeah you increase the parameters you no connections between the tokens more you have more connections with the tokens but many of those connections uh, remain very sparse uh, the statistical support uh, on uh, this uh, you know very large um, only uh, some um, uh, you know uh, parameters have strong uh, statistical support others have very weak uh, statistical support and when the system uses um, you know those uh, parameters with weak statistical support then you hallucinate then you have to make the things up uh, you know so um, uh, earlier on um, and things have somewhat changed uh, you know in i'm talking about few months um, uh, chat gpt uh, used 40 humans to capture the breadth of knowledge corresponding to uh, the data in the language model 40 knowledge of 40 persons is rather small there is so much human knowledge and uh, of we need different people if specialize in different uh, you know fields to provide all the knowledge so clearly this will be very limited also what happens is that essentially these people are uh, asked to uh, look at the answer generated by language model and uh, label them uh, and then from that label whether being true, wrong, or uh, you know other modifiers, uh, the language model learns. But that method of conveying uh, to a an AI system, um, you know that lab through labels is extremely uh, limited. Uh, human uh, language is very rich. Even knowledge is very rich. Uh, some knowledge may be conditional. Some knowledge, uh, you know, uh, will uh, you may say that. In the presence of this enzyme, there is this chemical, uh, you know, a bond that is formed between these two molecules. So that is not as simple language uh, knowledge as labeling something. That is a richer knowledge representation, and that is something that neither the human conveys to the chat GPT or, uh, you know, large language model, nor there is explicit mechanism in the language model to store represent that knowledge right so that is a key challenge that um that, you know uh, these systems have so here you see for example on the left hand side there is a simple knowledge where um uh, amit sheth is uh, you know uh, director of this company he has degree all this kind of stuff this explicit knowledge um with what you see is label director of or has a degree are not something that are uh, stored in the language model uh, when you in the question as uh, you know word like director it seeks the uh, you know term uh, uh, and mix it up but um, having uh, it to to be to to do a very good better job you need to have explicit you need to have such explicit knowledge there is another talk that i have given about the role of explanation explicit knowledge um, so because uh, all these uh, you know language models and this uh, you know uh, neural network systems are uh, have what we call as uh, implicit semantics, not explicit. Now, knowledge is very um, you know uh, varied, and there is a complex. Uh, you know, it is also complex in that. Um, just think about 
my conversation here with you. Uh, as I'm saying something, and as you learn uh, what I'm saying, or as you understand what I'm saying, you are using a lot of different types of knowledge. You are using a syntactic knowledge, you know, kind of in my, where I pause, you know how I break the words. You understand that. Um, your linguistic knowledge, like the, you know, knowledge that is in word net. You have common sense knowledge, like the knowledge that is in concept net. Your broad based general purpose knowledge, like the facts that, uh, you know, Rishi Sunak is a, uh, uh, became a prime minister of UK, uh, you know, around this time or on this date, um, and that can be in Wiki, that will be in Wikipedia or Wikipedia. And you have domain specific knowledge. Uh, some of you know something about healthcare. Some of you know something about uh, other field in which you have worked or collaborated with. Uh, so the, you know, for example, uh, there will be uh, UMLS, uh, which is a medical vocabulary, and that is a domain specific knowledge. So um, uh, you, human understanding of language and of information involves use of all this knowledge. My proposition is that without such knowledge, um, the language model is always going to have difficulty in understanding and you know, is always be inferior to the human, right? And so uh, there are certain things where it scales very well, it is fast, it is you know, where it does things very well, maybe it reads, um, uh, you know, um, a human that is not an expert in area, but it cannot hit, uh, you know, uh, beat a human uh, that is expert in the in that particular area too well. Uh, not always. So there are problems nowadays, uh, such as radiology, where the AI systems um, do very well. They even beat humans. Uh, but when you uh, look at deeply, um, that is largely because of the problem that are chosen, uh, where um, a lot of examples, you learn from examples and you learn from data. And, um, uh, and um, the, you, you're not combining knowledge from multiple sources. In these kind of things, um, yes, uh, these AI technologies today have surpassed human level of performance. But in others, no. And I'm talking today more about those other examples. So uh, using these, not, you know, what kind of knowledge and what kind of knowledge and knowledge graph, uh, uh, you know, can, can you uh, combine, use to uh, make the language models better than what they do. So it's explicit model of recency and common sense. Uh, there are missing knowledge. Uh, we know, um, you know, we, we think about world as concept, not world as probabilities. And, um, you know, we want to, we can supply user level explanations and safety constraints. These, all these things can be uh, made possible with the use of knowledge. <clears throat> so uh, here I'm talking about using knowledge through knowledge graphs in neural network pipelines. And this is, this is one form of, uh, you know, uh, knowledge powered neurosymbolic AI. And there are multiple ways uh, that you can uh, incorporate knowledge in the AI system in the in the uh, deep neural network. Um, there is one form which is called shallow infusion. So here, what happens is that you um, you know the language model or neural network uh, has implicit knowledge. Then you have knowledge that you convert into the same form. Basically, you vectorize the knowledge, just as data is vectorized. And you combine the vectors. And that is uh, an example of shallow infusion. There is a, 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 a semi-deep infusion where you uh, take the knowledge and add to the uh, you know, end layer of the um, uh, you know, multi-layer uh, or, or deep neural network. And uh, you essentially use the knowledge to improve the attention. You know, and um, the, for example, there may be term world war, and you may be able to use knowledge um, uh, saying that there are two, you know, there's World War One and World War Two, and with that, the model can uh, better understand whether the occurrence of World War in data uh, is uh, World War One or World War Two, right? So that's very, um, so these kind of improvements you can get with semi deep infusion, and then you can have deep infusion where you um, uh, have verify variety of knowledge like the hierarchy of knowledge that I just showed you here, 
right? You, you show, you show, here is a whole variety of knowledge. So the different knowledge and um, you, uh, you, you integrate knowledge at different levels of abstraction. Uh, abstraction is a very uh, powerful human concept. This is something, again, uh, today's AI systems and language models don't have. So um, um, very broadly speaking, um, you know, there are um, a variety of um, ways, uh, explicit, you know, variety of algorithms that have been developed and tested um, by uh, my team as well as number of other researchers. And um, so this is a very active area, but um, uh, it'll take a long time to talk about how exactly these are being done. But, um, uh, you know, broadly speaking, you have, uh, you know, neural networks uh, that are trained over data. You have knowledge, um, and the knowledge uh, is combined with the data in some way. Now, because the knowledge is uh, in a symbolic form, it uh, makes it easier to do reason, uh, you know, whether you plan or infer uh, apply inferencing. And um, um, you may also bring in number of, you know, uh, other important type of knowledge that I did not show you earlier. Think about uh, going to a doctor. A doctor will typically, uh, you know, use a clinical practice guideline uh, on which they are trained. So that is a, they are taught in their medical practice how to see this systematically. For example, for diagnosing, they may have learned that you can use this test to rule out this before you can be sure that it is this. Uh, you know, so, you know, high, uh, high blood pressure could be because of hyperthyroidism or hypertension. So you can do a test for a thyroid, you know, do the thyroid test and rule out uh, hyperthyroidism uh, and, uh, and then be, you can be sure that it is hyper, uh, you know, tension. So um, uh, now um, that kind of uh, process knowledge can also be brought in uh, into the system. And then uh, you interact with the systems and help uh, so user and help user understand, um, you know, how the, the AI system has uh, come up with um, uh, the answer. So here is an example. Um, there is this text here that you can see really struggling with my XYZ, right? Now with that text, what is happening is that um, on one hand, the deep neural network is, uh, you know, create using tokens from these and doing the learning, right? And it learns a variety of probabilities between the words. On other hand, uh, on the symbolic part of the equation here, we are um, mapping the um, uh, you know uh, concepts in the text, such as chaos in my relationship, or <coughs> obsessive intrusive thoughts, um, or I need to get uh, you know out of my head. All these things are mapped into the concepts in the knowledge graph. <clears throat> what you see on the left hand side is a knowledge extracted from, extracted from medical literature. When you have done, uh, when you can do that, you can put together, suppose using, uh, <coughs> uh, you know, a neural network, you can classify this as OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. In that case, um, uh, you know, there is a definition. You can read that definition of OCD. Now, because you know what concepts uh, the text maps to, you can see those concepts, uh, you know, whether the, this person is <coughs> obsessive, intrusive thoughts, ideas of, or sensations. And based on that, you can explain to the user I classified this text uh, as person having OCD, but the reason I am uh, comfortable in doing that is because it meets this condition, this definition. Current language models can't do this. So I hope you understand the clear value of language as in, in terms of explainability. And what I mean by explainability is user level explainability. explainability here the user may be a clinician or a patient. So 
explanation must be in the terms that they understand. This is not about software developer understanding how the system works. This is about uh, you know uh, understanding in the you know way the humans understand. Here, knowledge verified interpretable prediction uh, uses uh, process knowledge structure. So, on uh, this is uh, a, a, the the domain of uh, suicide, and uh, there is a um, CSSRS is a uh, specification of how to detect various aspects of suicide, such as suicide behavior, attempt, ideation, or attempt. Uh, sorry, so ideation, behavior, or attempt. And there is a reasoning as to why it is this versus not that. So uh, the reasoning is wish to be dead, non specific um, active social thoughts, active addition of some intent to act. The, you have to go through this questioning, the process that goes to this reasoning before you can label. So to apply this kind of reasoning, um, uh, you really need the knowledge. And this is what uh, uh, this particular thing shows. And, um, uh, you know, one very important thing uh, in AI today is uh, AI alignment. And, um, you know, just language model results, uh, you know, had performed 47% with the process knowledge when verified with clinicians, it did much better. Here is one more example of um, food recommendations. So um, in this case, somebody, uh, you know, our example um, is type 1 diabetes in children. And we need to figure out whether uh, if, if, if the, if the, if the uh, patient eats a particular food, whether that is acceptable or not with regards to the constraints of carbohydrate intake for this uh, uh, patient. And um, uh, the problem of understanding this kind of nutrition uh, or nutritional psychology is very difficult. You, um, you know that a person is eating something, you need to identify the recipe, then you need to identify the ingredients, you also need to identify cooking actions because uh, the same uh, you know ingredients uh, you know when cooked using a baking method or drawing method would lead to very different nutritional outcome um, you, you uh, if you reuse oil you may get trans fat also so in making use of this particular uh, type of so you want to use ai you'll have to use a lot of knowledge, a cooking process knowledge, a domain knowledge, this is specific knowledge if you're applying to uh, you know, clinical condition and personalized health knowledge. And with that kind of knowledge, then maybe you can get the response saying, eat this food, no, uh, or what are the healthy things in the food? What are unhealthy things in the food? And um, whether the daily, uh, value of calories within limit or not limit. So understanding the effect of cook, cooking actions and understanding the type of ingredients with respect to users' health conditions, allergy and food parents, this is a very challenging job. And again, uh, uh, it will be, um, I can't think of exactly how uh, a language model or generative AI technique will solve this kind of problem. And use of variety of knowledge will become a very important. One of the uh, most challenging uh, applications today is fact verification. A very large number of uh, uh, information on the internet today, on the social media, is fake. Uh, the fake news is everywhere. And um, so here is a uh, post that somebody had on the left-hand side. And he talks about uh, Michael uh, Jordan donating blood. Well. It so happens that um, um, you really need to have a lot of understanding 
of the situation before you can say um, whether this is right or wrong. So, um, um, I mean, you guys know that um, um, the Manipur riots got started with a uh, sharing of a photo uh, that was from year 2020. And the photo was taken in, I think, Delhi area or NCR and, and see what it led to. So the fake news can have very uh, severe outcomes. Um, so here, you need to understand a lot of things. You need to process the language and you need to process the, um, you know, the, 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 the image. Uh, so you start with um, the text and what we do in this case is to ask five W's. Who claims, what claims, when claims, where claims and why claims. And for each of them, you are trying to understand, you can see on the bottom part of the table, uh, uh, there is a fact news uh, that you found that Michael jo Johnson uh, visited hundreds of kids at SC hospital on that day. But there's no information that uh, this particular guy, uh, John Sphere, worked with that person. There's no information um, about who took the video, sorry, or photo. And you can go through a whole variety of things that you need to, uh, you know, uh, Michael uh, Jordan somewhere also um, said that this story is false, right? So you need to connect this piece of, um, you know, content um, with a lot of things uh, that's elsewhere on the internet, as well as you need to use knowledge. So what is happening here is that you are seeing that um, there's a, you know, MMKG's multimedia knowledge graph. So you're seeing um, M M Michael Jordan and you, you know that he contracted HIV. There's another thing about blood donation. And you say that um, person uh, who has uh, HIV, a who is HIV positive should not donate blood and um, things of that nature. So when you bring all that knowledge together, then you can reason and understand that uh, and come to a conclusion that this is a fake news or this is uh, incorrect. But you see what it all take took to do that. And this explanation explains very clearly the role of knowledge. Without this knowledge, you cannot understand that. So uh, I to summarize, I discuss the challenges with generative AI. I introduce you the role of knowledge and the new symbolic AI, or at least um, a broad, uh, you know, contours of neuro symbolic AI. And I uh, showed you um, the um, uh, role of knowledge for user level explainability and safety. Um, well, um, I use my uh, large team um, uh, of the AI Institute and my, my group. And um, I think, uh, and I think I left plenty of time to uh, entertain any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for this wonderful talk. Uh, I think uh, there are so many questions because there are so many participants are uh, joined, have joined. So uh, I request to all the participants, if you have any question, please uh, feel free to ask with the Professor uh, Amit Sweet, sir. Yeah, you may type in also if you're not able to unmute and speak. Uh, Dipali ma'am and uh, Shruti ma'am, Sushi ma'am, please, everyone, you can on the camera also. Yeah, so we can take a group picture. Hello, good evening, sir. Hello. I think first question can be asked by me only that um, regarding especially the information which is on the social media, how uh, efficiently we can use graph neural networks to find out the misinformation. 
because lots of misinformation, fake news detection, the work has been done. But apart from that, also there is lots of misinformation which is available. But um, how to you know find out whether these are facts or these are misinformation using uh, you know any kind of graph uh, techniques? Well, I actually showed you um, uh, you know uh, the um, challenges in. Uh, you know, yes. um, we just saw uh, one and, of these slides. What, yeah, and and what I want, what I'm, what I would like to say is that, um, you see here, um, uh, this fighter blue, QA, this mm -hmm. uh, this technology or tool, uh, is already implemented and works for, um, uh, for 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 textual data. So if right. you uh, you know if you go to let's see if I quickly jump uh, uh, give me just a second um, so uh, uh, there is a uh, uh, showcase and uh, we have one of I think probably the demo is posted here but there is a um, demo of fiber blue ki where you can uh, um and i can send you if you send me a, a question you know uh, if you can contact me by email or any other way um so um you can today type in the text and you'll get answer uh, with a lot of caveats meaning um that will be relatively instantaneous but um it would not be um uh, you know, a uh, hundred percent foolproof. Um, right. Use of uh, knowledge. So, for example, these systems um, would use um, knowledge extracted from uh, sources like Wikidata or Wikipedia. And to the right. extent that you have knowledge to refute uh, the assertion in the uh, text, the fake news or fake information, you'll be able to find, um, you know, this issue instantaneously. But the knowledge changes, uh, uh, you know, uh, constantly. And um, there may be a fake news about something very recent that may have just happened uh, to, you know, uh, yesterday. Many times a human would have read that in, as part of the news and they can say this is fake. Or if there is a, a human who is testing for whether it is fake news or not manually. So there are fact checks uh, websites uh, like Polity fact, Polit of Polity, uh, uh, Politico Facts. Right. So this website, there are humans who are checking it. It takes them a long time to take that, uh, you know, test that. With the technology, uh, in limited circumstances, you can today do that in real time. But the example I showed you, we cannot do today um, because understanding from image and getting knowledge from multiple sources and then doing all these is, is something, it's a matter of research right now. So we are working on those kind of things right now. Um, the amount of uh, fake news is so much that uh, there is, uh, we have to use technology. So, uh, you know, the, a website like Political Facts can only check five, seven, um, you know, uh, uh, news items per day. And they need, um, you know, multiple uh, human journalists to do that job. So 10% um, yeah. of um, uh, U.S. population have, uh, 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 you know, uh, agreed that they themselves made up, uh, uh, you know, misinformation. And 56% have agreed that they have knowingly forwarded such information. So, uh, so this is a, a big problem and uh, we'll have to uh, have technological solutions to solve this problem. Yes. And sir, apart from the politics, there is lots of medical misinformation as well, which is prevailing too much on the internet. And, uh, you know, fact checking that medical misinformation is, is very difficult. It is. Yeah. There is only one uh, a little bit of advantage with medical in that medical knowledge does not change that often. Yes. 
uh, as compared to uh, in yeah. a political or news items, which changes a lot more often. And um, large uh, knowledge graphs for medical domains are available. And yes. we are able to create them. So okay. uh, today, if you want to do research in the area, at least you would not have to do a lot of work in uh, getting the knowledge graph. Well, if they are not available very easily or some of them that have been developed, there's a paper in uh, Nature. They talk about developing a very large knowledge graph for healthcare domain from PubMed um, uh, literature, uh, but they're not made it public. Uh, now, yes. uh, our own team has developed a very large knowledge graph for, um, um, so we have a, a collaboration uh, funded by Vipro uh, with IIT Patna and Vipro and uh, my, you know, AI Institute. And um, there we developed a pharma knowledge graph with uh, um, right now more than, uh, you, know, uh, you know, 10 million facts. Um, so these are being, this is becoming possible, but I think it's a, it's a good area of research right now. Yeah, uh, we have one uh, question from the user. Uh, is generative AI applicable to prediction kind of things? This is the question that, uh, it has been asked. Yeah, generative AI is certainly used in prediction kind of things. Um, so um, only thing that you have to keep in mind is that uh, there is no free lunch. So you are um, predicting based on uh, what uh, data it is trained on. And um, there will be outside event that it may not know. So suppose I um, uh, take the example of uh, stock market prediction. Now, the system can be used for stock market prediction, but <clears throat> just this morning, there might be a new news on inflation. And uh, that, uh, you know, a language model trained on historical data may not be able to factor in. So technologically, yes, um, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, you have the technologies to do prediction. Practically using it, you, you, you have to say, well, does the AI system have all the information necessary uh, to correctly do the prediction? Or would it be trained on old data or uh, would not uh, be aware of new events? And uh, that there is no uh, enough um, knowledge about how this new event could change the outcome. So yes, uh, so answer is yes and no. Yeah, uh, uh, one more question by Sheetal. Uh, we are building these generative AI systems to bring machines closer to the human behavior, but these systems have a much longer way to go to human behavior. What do you say? I have to say about this. That is quite right. Um, so, um, uh, y y the human behavior uh, is. Um, let me let me give one example. One of the um, uh, well-known, um, uh, you know, area of AI application is autonomous vehicle. And um, now you want um, uh, the um, autonomous vehicle to make correct decision under various circumstances. Think about how humans make that decision. Humans have... Um, uh, you know, knowledge of the laws. Humans have um, or laws or regulations. Humans have knowledge about what is right or wrong. Now, that may change from one human to another human. But uh, at least uh, human society, I mean, we have what we have in the human society. And um, all these drivers are making their individual choices. And we are surviving. Yes, there are also accidents and such. And there are remedy when the accidents happen. You can get jail, you'll have court case, all that stuff. If you, the um, AI system doesn't have all those things. 
So um, it would be doing what it has been trained to do and it would be doing largely what it can learn from the data. Suppose um, uh, you have a um, medical situation and uh, the uh, patient has a serious um, uh, you know, illness. There is a choice of aggressive medical treatment with poor quality of life and the choice of non-aggressive medical treatment, palliative care, with the focus on um, quality of life for whatever life you have left. These are all human value systems. And you can't leave these kind of things to, uh, uh, you know, technology, any technology. So um, the society has a lot of, um, uh, is, you know, um, it's driven by a lot of things. It is driven by laws, rules, regulations, uh, ethics, morality, and, and, and some other things. Getting the AI system to appreciate those things to you know and, and get them to know and understand and apply, that is a bit way off. Other major thing that is uh, uh, that AI systems don't do very well is what is called as abstraction and analogies. So um, uh, I have another uh, uh, talk. If you go to um, uh, you know um, YouTube uh, and uh, let's see if I can show you. Um, so, um, uh, you know, if, if you go to uh, a, uh, YouTube AISC, why you you T U B E? Uh, you'll find, um, here a playlist for um, um, you know our the you know keynotes and such and I have, you know, the... so uh, here you'll find uh, other keynotes where I talk about um, the lower level of intelligence and higher level of intelligence. So uh, today AI technology is doing very very well with what I we would classify as lower level of intelligence and what are they? Low level of intelligence involve um, things like classification or um, uh, you know or prediction. They can be largely built on the data, and the task is given the data, classify into this, classify into that. Answers are a limited set of things that from which uh, there is one correct answer. Then there is high level of intelligence that humans do in decision making, and that is abstraction. And um, uh, and also, uh, so there are things like personalization, contextualization, abstraction. So if suppose uh, there is a picture, uh, you go to a museum, you look at an impressionist picture, uh, you know, uh, by Monet, let's say. Now, uh, your, how much, you are influenced by the style of painting, how much you are influenced by the French countryside in a particular season. These are very personal and these involve, um, uh, you know, use of various uh, faculties, various, you know, um, uh, uh, things that humans have. For example, you might be an artsy person and the other person may not be artsy. A husband and wife goes to uh, um, uh, a museum and husband, you know, one of them spends a lot of time uh, appreciating, other one simply wants to walk, walk through as fast as possible, right? So, uh, you know, um, also, um, suppose I, um, somebody asked you that you attended this talk, what did you learn? You as a human will hopefully be able to say one, two or three things that you remember. Now, from all the words that I have spoken and all the slides that I have shown, you came up with those two, three items to discuss with others, somebody else. This is called abstraction. And um, your friend is asking you because they trust your opinion on this. 
and uh, if you because the, you the, the, your friend thinks that you know about this topic well and you can explain to that person these are all abstraction jobs analogies complex analogies this is also very hard simple analogies like you know uh, that are asking tests that 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 the ai system can do very well complex analogies that involve uh, you know understanding in this situation this happens and this situation this happens uh, that um, how somebody makes a metaphor as an example uh, those things are hard for the uh, for the ai systems to do so i hope i uh, gave you the answer yes uh, just one question by me then we have two more questions uh, like we are, uh, we, uh, you were talking about fake uh, news detection and all uh, using knowledge graphs. We are using at one side AI to identify something which is fake, and on the other side we are using AI to generate the fake. So then, um, how how we can go about uh, resolving this conflict? So uh, this is a good question, and um, you saw the. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the uh, Elon Musk and uh, Kamala Harris video uh, uh, picture that I was able to come up with very easily by just typing, couple, you know, a sentence. And um, so generating of the fake news is very, very easy now, right? Because of generative AI. So it is a cat and mouse game. So um, one of my students has done very exciting work or actually it's a team There is, you know, all these problems are hard, so it takes team. In uh, predicting whether some text or image is generated by, by human or a system. Uh, just last week, uh, Google announced that they will be supporting um, watermarking on images or, or the content that their systems generate. That helps. AI generated content is going to be a big problem. Having a foolproof um, uh, uh, technique to say this is generated by AI or not um, is unlikely in very near future. It becomes more likely if we have um, participation of the technology developers such as watermarking, that makes it much easier. We are, you know, we and other researchers are working very, you know, hard to say whether this is by AI or uh, human. There is a tool on the web, AI or human, uh, and uh, you can try it out, but, uh, you know, it will give you something, uh, you know, text and it'll ask you whether this was generated by a human or AI. And many uh, times you will fail or your answer will be incorrect. So it is very hard for humans to recognize. Uh, it is true or false. Also, it is generated by AI or human. And um, for technology to understand, also it is hard. Yet uh, reasonable, so the uh, tools that, for example, we are able to, the, the tool that we are able to develop is uh, decent, but not perfect. So these are the kind of things that are happening uh, in the field. It's a very... Um, Two of the more exciting uh, work from my group recently uh, are in this AI or human, and uh, other other is uh, sorry, there are several, but the other is um, uh, an index that um, tells you uh, how much hallucination this language model has. So hallucination yeah. index is uh, another very interesting work. Third very interesting work is this analogy. Uh, you know, um, task. So, um, finding the analogy and supporting abstraction uh, is another very challenging thing. Uh, uh, yet another one is this fake news thing that I showed you. The example of yes. um, uh, Michael Jordan I uh, presented that uh, is from uh, the ongoing research. We, we are not completed it, but that's going on. But that's, that's a potential research area, we can say, where even our researchers can work. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, very, yeah. very good. Absolutely. Yeah. So we have a question by Bhushan Zope, sir. Nowadays, many knowledge graph embeddings methods use LLMs. Aren't we bringing the disadvantage of LLMs into knowledge graph by doing this? 
Um, no, I mean, you see, the thing is that uh, language models um, are, uh, and more importantly, the transformer, uh, you know, are the now pretty well demonstrated way to exploit very large amount of data. So to the extent that you um, have large amount of data that you can train your model on, uh, you'll have to accept large language models and then say, what can I do? If you don't have language models, yes, there, there are advantages like the ones that I showed. And your, in that sense, their question is valid that the, the technology comes with disadvantages so problems like the ones I showed you. But the solution is to uh, go hybrid way to uh, say that you can't solve the problem with data alone. You can't solve the problem with knowledge alone. Uh, embedding, by the way, itself means loss of information. Remember, when you are converting a knowledge graph with entities and labeled relationships into a vector, you are losing information. You can't do round, round tripping of you know, vector and convert back into the graph uh, with the full fidelity. You, 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 know, you understand what you know, that means. So embedding by itself is a compromise. It's a compromise because we have been able to build very scalable systems using vector technology. All right, so uh, you know we create these, you know, vectors from billions of tokens and you know billions of documents and so on and so forth. That is doable, and that gives you certain power. Um, knowledge by alone is also not going to be the solution because it is slow. So uh, this gives me, uh, you know, uh, the analogy of what is called a system verse versus system two. Uh, you know, the Daniel Kahneman, who was uh, who was given Nobel Prize for economics, um, you know, has this book called uh, Thinking Fast and Thinking uh, and Thinking Slow, and he popularized this idea of system one and system two. If you uh, go to that. Uh, um, uh, the video that I had, uh, you know, uh, so if you go to this video uh, in my, let me see if I can share with you. Um, uh, zoom. So this video here that I, you know, the first video that will play, if you go to the keynote playlist of uh, the AISC website and YouTube is on uh, semantic cognitive perceptual computing. So uh, you know this. There is a. There is a. Um, uh, let's see if I can. So it is based on this um, a paper: semantic cognitive and perception computing uh, paradigms that shape shape human experience. So there, also I talk about. Um, uh, perception and cognition and semantics and perception is uh, system one, meaning uh, your, um, uh, your data comes and your brain makes instantaneous decision, right? For example, uh, you are walking on the road and um, the car is coming in your direction, you'll suddenly, you know, change your route, you jump and get out of the way of the car. That is a perceptual, um, you know, reaction. The perception is very fast. It takes, uh, you know, milliseconds uh, to re respond or, you know, a second or two maximum. Cognition is a system two activity in deliberate activity. And that uh, requires the use of knowledge and reasoning. And, you know, your brain is constantly working, you know, uh, and thinking today I have X, Y, Z, uh, you know, thing to do. It's already past six uh, uh, o'clock. Uh, this talk is going longer. This is, these are the things that are happening in your brain. It takes time. It is not instantaneous. It's combining the fact that you have to go home and do something and then you are more sensitive to the time. That is system two, right? And uh, we are constantly connecting these two uh, aspects of, you know, capability of a system. So cognitive and perceptual things are constantly going on in your brain. For the AI also, uh, through the neo-symbolic AI, 
where the data driven uh, uh, neuro symbolic is system one kind of system approximation and a knowledge driven slower uh, system that does reasoning is in, in, in cognitive processing is system two kind of system and we need both just like our brain needs to, we, we humans need to do both of them the same thing is that we are trying to develop AI system we are done very in the first phase of AI we call, only did last century we only did um, symbolic AI in the second phase of AI we saw you know with the machine learning and deep learning massive uh, progress in the uh, this uh, you know system one kind of uh, activity but now some of us realize and that's why I wrote that paper uh, and I, I also keynote on the, uh, these other aspects of it there's a keynote that talks about a explicit knowledge. Uh, so that's where I go with this low level intelligence versus high level intelligence, um, uh, the uh, system one versus system two, uh, you know, data driven system versus knowledge driven system. And um, uh, the future, you know, AI, the future of the AI, I believe is more along trying to combine the two, uh, make progress in each of them, but also figure out a better way of combining them to give you an important uh, understanding. Uh, just, just one idea. One of the ways we do is to infuse knowledge in the neural network. And we call this knowledge infused learning. It's a class of neural embolic system where the priority is given to the neural network based processing. Other type of system is to uh, extract patterns from the sim neuro neural network and align those patterns with symbolic knowledge, knowledge graph. We call this knowledge elicitation based neuro symbolic AI. And uh, there are both of these, uh, both of them have pros and cons, but at least both of them are investigating uh, the coexistence of uh, this uh, system one and system two. And that together they make for more powerful system than either of them alone. Yes, sir. Last question. Uh, it's been asked by Ranjit Bidwe, sir. A major difficulty in medical research is the lack of the data set, especially a data set that represents human behavior. For the expansion of medical data sets, generative AI has lately been advised. How practical is it? Whether it will impair the model's performance? Uh, my this is a difficult and very good question. Uh, my, um, we do a lot of work with medical, uh, uh, you know, field, uh, and um, you might have seen in that second pic, you know, slide itself. We work on uh, seven, eight medical conditions as we speak. Now, um, I don't think that um, generative AI is. Uh, going to be a good representation of actual human generated text. Depending, it depends on what kind of medical or healthcare, uh, you know, uh, related research we, you are doing. Um, today, more and more medical collections are being available. So for the EMR, um, there is um, uh, this well-known collection that's available. They, are, they have tens of thousands of electronic medical records, anonymized. Somebody like me who is luckier, um, uh, I have access to 25 million, uh, you know, of the medical records. So, you know, you know, I, you know, we collaborate with um, many uh, researchers, research groups in India. And I, we are not the only one, there are others who have access to those things. So the idea would be for you to uh, find the groups who have the data and collaborate with them. Um, I have uh, many interns from India uh, and uh, they uh, do internships and then they access to our large GPU cluster uh, of NVIDIA uh, latest GPUs and, um, and the data and also the guidance. And so, perhaps not for you, but your students may be able to do that uh, very well. Uh, the second is um, large corpora of um, uh, medical imaging is are, are available. Um, 
of certain kind, particularly radiology are available, but they are not public. So they are within the, um, uh, you know, uh, let's say Mayo Clinic or uh, Will Cornell Medical Center or, or, or other medical institutions. Um, now, you will not be able to um, create synthetic generative AI-based uh, uh, medical uh, corpus and compete with those who have real-world uh, data because the quality will simply not be there. The distribution, the representativeness, um, uh, the complexity, all these are, I don't think, possible to generate using uh, generative AI today. Uh, to guide the generative AI to... Um, mimic uh, a particular uh, human cohort, uh, I don't know how it can be done in the near future. Uh, so um, uh, if you are doing, uh, you know, if you need literature, of course, you can have uh, 20 plus million PubMed, uh, uh, you know, uh, abstract, um, and uh, you can use those. So it depends on, medical is very vast field. Um, you know, we work with Apasia, uh, uh, we work with autism, we work with uh, diabetes, we work with mental health uh, and suicide, we work with, you know, asthma. And all of them have different answers. Uh, we once had um, a project, we've completed a project where uh, we had um, uh, 100 and two, we consented 200 uh, asthma patients, uh, completed 150 evaluations. Uh, and these were one or three months of use of technology that we had developed, uh, collecting 29 different parameters every day, up to 1,852 data points per patient per day. And so uh, what I'm saying is that a lot of effort are being done in cre creating uh, you know, high quality medical data. I am worried that uh, uh, any generative you know, AI uh, generated data would be uh, unrepresentative and um, uh, unlikely to um, really uh, uh, be good enough for you know getting a paper accepted, even if uh, even if that is the modest um, uh, uh, you know uh, target you have, getting uh, it won't be accepted by medical community for sure. Yes, so I think we have uh, we are done with uh, today's question answers. Yeah, Shruti ma'am. Yeah. Sir, um, thank you so much for taking out time and um, giving okay. such an insightful talk. Yes, ma'am. Can I ask one question? Yes, ma'am, please. So, yeah. sir, um, uh, let me introduce. Uh, she is Dr. Arundhati Varke, uh, who is our Deputy Director, ma'am, uh, for academics. And also, she is a, a you know renowned mathematician and um, having plethora of experience. So please, ma'am. Uh, is it possible to develop an algorithm for any uh, chronic disease uh, uh, with the help of symptoms, which will be which will uh, allow the practitioner to identify uh, the actual disease of the patient or the severity of the patient? Yes, uh, you the, um, you ask a very uh, clear uh, question and. Um, um, here I do have an uh, uh, answer now um, with a lot of qualifications. First of all, um, theoretically, uh, developing all these uh, algorithms is quite possible. But if you're talking about chronic disease or any medical thing, one very important thing is uh, evaluation. Yes. Uh, you, you know, so that does mean that you have access to right cohort you can collect right amount of data. And um, uh, the strategy would be the typically, the class of uh, algorithms that we develop, uh, the neurosymbolic AI algorithms, where we trained on uh, um, uh, you know, large amount of uh, data available, uh, whether it is, um, it depends on the uh, application. We uh, have um, worked on, let's say, um, um, addiction. And we got a lot of data from social media like Reddit and uh, web forums. We have worked on mental health. We got a lot of data from social media. We worked on uh, several other diseases where we got data from uh, uh, clinical records, doctor hospitals themselves or doctor created data. Um, 
So you need a, a lot of data. We, and in some other cases, we actually created systems that collected patient data, like the asthma, exa asthma example that I gave. But A, you need a lot of data. B, you need um, um, a class of system that I was saying uh, called a neurosymbolic AI system. Because uh, in a healthcare context, one of the big reasons why doctors or clinicians do not accept a use of AI today, at least, is because if you build a system using language model or a genetic AI or neural network, they are block black box system. Mm. So these algorithms, are, you know, how they function and how they process data to get to the outcome is not explainable. Correct. All you have is the input and you have output and say you use this class, uh, a technique. That's all you have. So the results of these systems are not explainable. So even if you show to the doctors that look, on average, uh, the algorithm performs better than uh, an average doctor, the doctor cannot accept this because for a given patient, how would you know whether uh, you know the algorithm you work in the same way the doctor will do the decision making? For one of the very important thing is that doctors have to follow some medical start, standard. At least good doctors will do that. We call that medical practice guideline. So, uh, you know, they, they use a particular reasoning uh, a technique to come up with the uh, diagnosis. <coughs> they also look out comorbidity and other things to come up with the uh, treatment plan. So the issue is uh, <coughs> algorithm will need both data and knowledge. <coughs> and, and many people have started to develop these algorithms. But we have to remember that we have to go through this high standard of proving that this algorithm uh, <coughs> is explainable and it is safe. I gave an example of mental health chatbot where the chatbot can come up with the question that could be hurtful to a patient. You also do uh, prevent that. So with all these caveats, this is what a lot of, lot of us are working on. Okay. Once we test it <clears throat> with the real world, with the involvement of doctors, I mean, most of my projects with healthcare all actually projects of healthcare work with doctors. So we don't do work in isolation as AI research or scientists. Our team have uh, actual function doctor and in many cases we have actual access to the patient. That is the way you can develop a system that they will have confidence in, uh, they will have trust in the system and then they will consider using it. And also in the near term, it will not be that you'll use AI system alone separately. Yeah. You are going to use AI system in an assistive way to help the doctor. Right. So I'll Sir, give one example. Uh, we took actual, uh, uh, you know, corpus. We took a corpus of conversation between patients and doctor. Mm -hmm. And from that, we developed an abstractive summarization system where uh, roughly fifty-six. Uh, sentences on average of mm -hmm. conversation were cut down to seven sentences. So when the patient comes to see the doctor after three or six months, to get a quick review, the doctor does not have to read 56 sentences. Right. He or she can read just uh, five, uh, seven sentences and get a very quick update. These kind of uh, things where you are not uh, replacing the doctor but you are uh, likely uh, making doctor more productive or uh, giving them the options yes. or pointing out, you know, here is the radiology, here are all the things you found, but let the doctor be involved in saying this looks, again, this can, this can be a, a malignant, we need to do biopsy. Don't, you know, you can't entirely automate it, but partially automating that kind of systems uh, will come out, you know, have started to come out already. Sir, I ask this question because in uh, in many part of India, particularly in rural areas, the doctor they are not aware means the, they are new practitioner and they may not be aware about all the new technology and techniques. So this will help them to identify may not be hundred percent but 50, 60 percent the uh, disease of the patient. I I totally agree with you uh, because 
there are you know even even in us let's say my own state here where i am south kenya um the access to mental health is very poor very poor yes uh, uh you know if you are have great insurance and you are in urban area you will be lucky to have uh, uh you know access to a mental health uh, uh, expert Sorry. doctor in 6 weeks yes. but what about the people in rural areas and with uh, you know little or no insurance so here we have to go for with the technology and we do telehealth as well as we do some more automation so that we co- we can do triaging and yeah. we can take care of many um a less severe conditions hmm. uh, with limited and little mental uh, you know doctor um, you know for example you can have a nurse practitioner hmm. take care of many situations and come to doctor only on the severe cases yes so uh, the use of technology to scale um, you know there are uh, 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 56 uh, so uh, in the mental health between uh, us uh, and uh, india there is a difference of uh, something like 10 to 100 times in fewer oh. in india yeah right now uh, either you have choice of not having any medical help or have or you use technology to give some medical help that uh, would uh, you know is not going to be automated fully but would reduce doctors um, um We'll, we'll scale up the doctor and we'll reduce doctor's uh, you know effort so so those things we have to go for thank you sir thank mm-hmm. you sir. thank you very much shruti yeah. over to you yes ma'am thank you so much for asking such a uh, you know interesting question um so amit sir thank you so much for joining today for giving us so many insights um at symbiosis institute of technology we are um, you know a bunch of professors who are also uh, full time researchers so um, you know research is something which is um, inculcated into our teaching learning pedagogy itself and uh, our director dr ketan kotecha he himself is a very ardent um, ai researcher and um, we have also former research lab here uh, itself in symbiosis which is known as symbiosis center for applied artificial intelligence and um, you know after working into uh, the sky research lab for 5 years now we have also started with an ai program as an outcome of that research lab so uh, that is the kind of um, um, you know teaching learning pedagogy that we are following here and um, definitely we would be um, you know very happy to have you as mentor for uh, sit for both the departments for computer science as well as for uh, ai as well so um, thank you so much for um, you know gracing um, the conference as well and um, you know giving such a, um, uh, you know inspiring talk and um, i would say you are leading the path for us um, especially in generative ai and uh, the nlp field thank you very much for the opportunity it was wonderful talking to you all so yes, yes sir and we are waiting uh, for you to visit sit yes when you come in december schedule. yes which, which, which city you are in we are in pune sir pune sir maharashtra and i al- also will have the chance to meet you sir yes sir <laughs> it's very nearby gujarat sir where you are landing yeah. in yes sir please yeah, no, uh, i'll see i mean uh, you know you come after some years and in so many days you can only do so much but let's see true, true. yes yeah sir please keep uh, your eyes on the chat box there are so many compliments for your talk and uh, more oh. than 70 participants participants have been joined during your talk so thank you so much for accepting so our invitation so who, who all attended the conference um, are they from prim- primarily from your institute your university or they were i thought Uh, also for now is there maybe few few guys from um uh, europe yes sir uh, some of them from outside authors uh, uh, from europe and uh, hungary and uh, uh, uk 
uh, I don't hmm. know who has joined, uh, didn't check one by one, but this time from MIT University, Dr. Ashwini Kumar Dubey, and uh, from Sharda University, Delhi, and from uh, the symbiosis, so many, uh, all the departments, maximum they have joined, and students are also there, uh, like Bhushan Jope and uh, Ranjit Bidwe, who has asked the question, they are the PhD students of Dr. Shashikala and uh, uh, in this department. So uh, this is a mixed crowd from all over. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The Sounds faculty good. of CAC and AIML department, all of them, they have joined uh, because ma majority of them, their research area is AI and NLP, as well as they are having uh, their own uh, uh, PhD students. So they are also looking out for opportunities to get some insights uh, where their students, their MTech students can work out. Hmm. So they so have also the, joined largely. One of the things um, you may want to consider is um, to, um, uh, you know, have them do uh, internships. Um, um, there are, um, you know, a uh, lot of, but they need to be very good, uh, at least uh, initially in techni technical terms. Um, uh, we have, um, we had put a, um, you know, a call to uh, for internship uh, and 500 plus students apply in one week so there's a lot of interest and then many of these students um, those who persist and really work um, they are able to co-author the papers at, for the top conferences and that experience they get uh, and the advantage is that they have you know more access to the data and guidance mentorship uh, from my PhD student and um, uh, the GPU cluster we have so the experience they can get in um, uh, writing paper for top conference, let's say ACL or ENMLP or all that. Uh, we had a paper except two papers, uh, two, I think two, two in uh, ACL. If you look at authorship, there are always two, three, four, uh, you know, uh, uh, authors that are, uh, you know, interns that have worked on that project because these days doing um, AI work, uh, especially in things like language models, takes a lot of uh, effort, a lot of time and activities has to be done. So um, um, it takes really a team to do that. Um, uh, you, If you go to top conferences, you'll see that uh, average number of uh, authors is always uh, is gone up. And uh, often authors will be from multiple institutions and um, uh, what what I think India needs to do best is to um, stop publishing in uh, some of these, um, uh, you know, poor quality journals and, and conferences and go for at least B grade and higher <coughs> conferences or impact, impact factor three and higher journals. One of those good papers are worth many uh, papers in the poor place and <clears throat> learning how to pu publish in this kind of conference, all the things it goes. Having collaborations will bootstrap your effort, make it make your efforts faster to do that. And once you learn, uh, then you know how to do it and then you can repeat on your own. So that's something to think about. Yes, sir, sure. Bye now. Um, okay. Yeah, go Thank ahead. Thank you, sir. Hmm. Yeah. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank, Thank you so much, sir. Yeah. Bye.